in your fundamental trading for currencies, can you share with us how you did it? What, I mean, it was totally non-quantitative, would you say? Totally. And so did you, <coughs> did you use, for example, technical analysis? People argue no, the charting. Do any, I didn't do any technical analysis. I, I, I read all the newspapers, uh, The Economist. There was a lot of writing. Uh, I just paid a lot of attention to, to currencies. And in, in these currencies have just been tradable. Uh, in the open market, because some some countries still had fixed currencies, fixed to the dollar, and you couldn't. Uh, well, you could trade it, but it was it, it, it was fixed. But uh, so it was it was just fundamental fundamental stuff, and uh, it worked. It worked reasonably well, I would say. It worked reasonably well, um, and uh, so. But that was it. But but the problem. With a, a business like that, is I'd walk in one day, everything was going my way. Oh, I'm a genius. The next day, I'd walk in, everything was against me. Oh, I'm a dope. It was a very stomach wrenching business. Whereas with a system that you can develop, okay, you have a system. You you do what the computer says to do. You have a, made a historical study of the system that you're using, and it worked with a very high probability the system was going to work. And uh, so I, I was much more satisfied with that approach. And, uh, and we hired scientists and so on to build these systems and improve them. Okay, so now let me talk about the Medallion Fund. So, you know, when I teach in directory finance, I usually start with a single equation on the board, and the equation is, Mathematics plus money equals finance. And I would argue that the Medallion Fund pretty much epitomizes that because the system, that, as you described, has yielded just extraordinary returns. And at this point, the track record is confidential. But you did give an interview, uh, one of the very few interviews that you gave in 2000 to Hal Lux. And so I want to just read to you what was written at that time about the Medallion track record. Uh, Simons, by contrast, just keeps getting better. Consider his performance over the past decade, uh, and this is between 1988 when it was launched and 2000. Since its inception in March 1988, Simon's flagship $3.3 billion medallion fund has amassed annual returns of 35.6% compared with 18% for the S&P during that, that same time. that was after time. fees. That was after fees, and at that time, the fees for the medallion fund at its peak was five and 44. So 5% fixed fee, and 44% of the profits. So that, that track record uh, yielded 2,478.6% return over the 11 years from 98 to, uh, sorry, 88 to 99. And the next best fund in the hedge fund databases at the time was the Soros fund, the quantum fund, which was only 1,710%. Oh, oh. So, <laughs> so and, but that was of 2000. So um, first question, How's the track record been since then? Because nobody knows, for sure. I know. <laughs> <laughs> and, a few, and a few other people know. Uh, the track record has continued good. good. We, we, I don't know if at that time we'd already raised the fees to 5 and 44. First, we raised them to 5 and 36. And then uh, the investors all complained, but they just wanted to have more. So how can I get more? And uh, then 5 and 44, and there was still a very good return at 5 and 44, so no one wanted to redeem. But we realized that there was a limit to how much we could manage. We understood the uh, you know, our system, and uh, you know, it could manage a certain amount, but it couldn't ama uh, manage huge, you know, huge amounts, you know, trillions, uh, hundreds of billions. It certainly couldn't manage that kind of money. So we decided to, and because we were making so much money, uh, the fund was growing internally. First, we uh, prevented any outsiders from no new investing uh, investment from outsiders, except for the employees. And then uh, we decided to buy in the outsiders. That was in 03, I think. 03, 04, and 05. By the end of 05, uh, we had bought out all the outside investors, and it was just owned by, owned by the uh, employees. And it did grow to some extent, 
uh, but because uh, it, it did, and it could manage that much, but at a certain point, it's been it's been uh, capped off. And uh, we started in, in that same year, '05. We started some funds for the public, which have done very nicely, uh, and they have no uh, uh, clash with Medallion. They're they're much longer term expectations, but uh, th those funds have done very nicely, and uh, so. At the moment, there's, a, that, there's 45 billion in those funds being managed, and uh, but the medallion fund has always stayed. The You've medallion fund it. has stayed at a certain size, which I won't share. Yeah, but it's not as big as 45 million. Yes. And can you share with us how many employees you have? Yeah, we have 310 or 20 or something like that. Yeah, and counting everyone. We have a lot of scientists. Uh, we we really. You know, you have to, in a business like this, just keep making things better, keep improving the system, because other parts of it are going to wear out after a while. People will catch on to this or they'll catch on to that. So you, you just have to, like in any business, in any business, you just have to make things better and better and better, because that's what everyone else is trying to do. And uh, so, so we hire the best scientists we can. Uh, people have said to me, oh, well, you, you know, you're, you're not doing the world a favor. These people could be doing great science, you know, for, uh, they'll make all this money and then they'll give it to charity. I'm not worried that it's going to ruin the world by having uh, good scientists working at Renaissance. But we do have good scientists working there. And, uh, and that's been, that's been the model. The model has been first, Hire the smartest people you possibly can. Well, that's a sensible uh, uh, principle. Work collaboratively. Let everyone know what everyone else is doing. Now, some firms that do have these systems, they have little groups of people, this is ours, and this is theirs, and, and they'll get paid accordingly, and so on, to how their system goes. We have one system, and once a week, there's a research meeting. If someone has something new to present, it gets presented. It gets chewed, or chewed up and, and, and looked at. From Everyone has a, a chance to, the code is there. They can run the code and see what they think is, does this really work, and so on. So it's a very collaborative enterprise, and, and I think that's the best way to accelerate science is people working together. And uh, so that's, that's that. And uh, we have great infrastructure, wonderful infrastructure, so people can get right to work. Uh, we've had people come in and start to work and say, my god, I'm, I'm doing this after, after three days. I've never been in any place where you could get up and running so quick. So uh, it's well organized, and we have great people. Uh, we had a uh, we have a, a Renaissance a, a colloquium uh, every week. Someone comes and gives a talk. The scientists, and, and it's open to the public. And uh, one day, an astronomer, a young astronomer, came in. A friend of his already worked at Renaissance, and and this guy came and he and he gave a very good talk. He gave a very good talk. And I took him aside afterwards and says, you know, your friend is here, and. Uh, you would like working here. You would like working here. We would like to have you work here. And he said, well, it sounds very appealing, but I'm, right now I'm in a project that I, a science project, that I really want to complete before I think about doing anything else. So he won the Nobel Prize. <laughs> he won the Nobel Prize. He was one of the two teams that learned that the universe, instead of decelerating was actually accelerating and it was it was big news and so I think he made the right decision I, you know <laughs> <laughs> most people would but that's the rather have a Nobel Prize so uh, so he's the only scientist of Nobel Prize quality that we almost got and and, and I don't think anyone else in the firm is probably uh, that good although some of them have been terrific I, I uh, some of them I don't know, uh, 
they don't give Nobel Prizes in mathematics, but, uh, but they do in physics, of course, and we have a lot of people who are physicists. Experimental physicists do well, astronomers do well. Uh, they look at a lot of data and analyze it, and that's, and that's what we do, that's analyze data. So that leads me to my next question. How do you manage all of these incredibly talented people, often with really huge egos? You, you talked about collaboration, but uh, having been a, a chair of a department, and you're having been a chair of a department, uh, it's not always easy to get big egos to collaborate. Well, <clears throat> a department chair does not have that much power. Right. Uh, <laughs> and, and I'm sure and any professors in the audience uh, know that. Uh, you don't have to do what your department, oh, if he says you have to teach this class, okay, you teach this class. But as far as your research goes, uh, you can do what you want. Um, so, uh, but we did at Renaissance say, you know, we'd like you to work over in this area or work over in that area. But, uh, but nonetheless, so there are groups. There are groups that work on different things in, in the research area. But because they see what's going on every week in everyone else's group, they can sometimes and often do make a suggestion. Hey, you know, what we're doing over here, I think could affect what you want to do over there. The, the, the way people are paid, everyone gets a, a piece of the profits. And, uh, but they're judged. It's not, what did you accomplish? I, this year, you know, I, I'd have every year people come in, would come in to me and say, you know, I made so much money for the company. My work I made so much money for the company last year. I, I deserve a big raise. I said, oh yeah, well that was that was good work. Didn't it derive from so and so's work? He says, yeah, yeah, but we we I, I really made it better. And and I said, well, and didn't you work with Joe and Susan on this? Yes, yes, I, I agree. I, I did. I did that. So I said, you know, if I added up all the money that everyone who comes in here tells me they made for the company this year, it would be five times as much as, as the company made. <laughs> so, uh, you know, uh, but we look back on three years, four years, five years, how have they done? And uh, they'll get raises accordingly. Um, and, um, and that's the way it works. And people, are, well, no one's perfectly happy with everything. And I can't say there's no one who thinks he should be paid more, which is human nature. But uh, everyone's pretty happy. It's a, it's a very happy place. It's so, a very happy place. So, so this, this leads me to the, the, the final point that I wanted to make about the Medallion Fund and what, what you built over the years. So you must know that, that you and your colleagues at Renaissance have been an inspiration to many, many quantitative investors, many students here, many faculty, uh, myself included. And the favorite topic among quants getting together for beer or, or stronger um, is how do you do it? And why is it the case that even to this day, there's nobody close to Renaissance? And so I have my own conjecture that I'd like to run by you and, and get you to react okay. to it. And my conjecture is a little different. It's not about the systems. It's not about any particular magic formula or, or uh, algorithm, but rather, being at a management school, uh, I guess I'm biased. I actually think it's about the management. Specifically, I think it's the combination of the fact that you actually ended up being a very good prop trader uh, first, before you even thought about the mathematics. You actually became a good trader. And then with that intuition of what it means to make money and lose money, you ended up being a good people picker. And you ended up building around you an extraordinary team. And that team has grown based upon the culture that you created. You just mentioned that at the end of every year, you have these awkward conversations with people. Who can adjudicate among these very big egos except somebody that commands the respect of anybody? So do you agree or disagree with that characterization? More or less. I mean, it was, it was certainly good to have done fundamental trading to you know, just understand the, the mechanics of markets and, and, and so on. Uh, of course, we, we don't do that. People don't do that. And I have to say, I left Renaissance uh, when I was 72. 
So that was almost nine years ago. And the management there uh, just carried on. We had some great leaders. And uh, we haven't missed a beat. Uh, they've done just as well, maybe better, than they would have if I had stuck around. But I felt uh, it was time for the younger people to take over. I was had started spending more of my time with our foundation, which is a topic of next week's uh, encounter. And uh, so I thought, OK, what? It was two people who were co-executive. Uh, I don't know. I don't remember what their title was. But they had a very high title. And gradually, I'd given them more and more uh, responsibility. So when I left, uh, it, was, it was just fine. And, uh, and I always keep pushing them to hire very smart young people. And that's, I think, my biggest uh, contribution. I'm the chair. We meet every every month and so on. But just hiring great young people into the, uh, into the, into the business is, is the best thing you can do.